All right, this is lesson 12 of our homiletics. Uh, we have come to the tail end of uh, what we have been uh, struggling with. But I, I trust that it has been a very joyful journey. Uh, I enjoy this a lot. And there's a lot of uh, refreshing, you know, that, that I did. All right, uh, we always have this man walking around, this brother with the Bible. Now he is in a different place. Uh, wherever we see the word of God purely preached and heard, there a church of God exists, even if it's swam with many faults. So John Calvin tells us, now one of our biggest uh, mistakes is try to uh, preach to a perfect church. Is that we are imperfect preachers and trying to preach to a perfect church or at least through our sermon, that we will produce a perfect church. It's not going to happen, all right? So uh, one day you become a pastor, one day you become uh, an itinerant preacher. Whichever church that you go to, you will discover that they are not perfect, okay? And then the last session, we learn about uh, outline. And so the, you will be engaging yourself, uh, you'll be involving yourself with this more often uh, during this, this couple of weeks, even after the class session, I will be uh, talking to you one-on-one -on -one so that to guide you through with your first uh, sermon outline and then later on with your sermon and then with your preach sermon where you will have it on video. So uh, this will be very simple introduction, body, and conclusion. And then the last session, we talk about what introduction is all about. Uh, you always write it last but you preach it first. And then uh, if you are in a new place or you are a new preacher or you are being introduced, uh, it's good to have some icebreaker, something that will, uh, you know, uh, endear yourself with the audience. It's always good to start with uh, the audience liking you. Uh, so in the Philippines, normally I will greet them in... Uh, the Tagalog language and the few lang uh, the few words I know like uh and then or greet them uh uh magapo, you know, things like that. So this language of the, the heart will, will will cause the people to you know to be drawn to you. For example, let's say an American Caucasian pastor will come and then you he will greet you uh ma or you know, or like Chauan or something like that, or Kan Chu, then you say, wow, at least he make an effort to learn my language. So that will be the point whereby you make an effort to learn some kind of a greeting in the local language. Huh? And then also uh, you arm yourself with a couple of jokes, uh, make sure that they're all clean and also make sure that they are what we call culturally relevant. <laughs> Sometimes you, you <laughs> Sister Karen told that joke, remember? <laughs> he, he didn't uh, remember about it. That the cat, uh, no, the dog on the couch. Uh, and people are like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> All right. So you have to know the background that, uh, you know, why the dog is not allowed on the couch. So, and then uh, in your introduction yourself, I, I, I told you, you may have to write down some pointers uh, so that uh, you have something to follow. Uh, because sometimes uh, you are trying to be like us who have been preaching for 30 years, and then you just come up and expect to say something. I can assure you, in the beginning, you tend to go blank, all right? Unless you are very experienced and you have been a coach or you have been a speaker in, in, in other uh, platform. And then we talk about the four handles. Uh, now, handles are very important. Like, for example, when I am uh, going to drink uh, 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 coffee, I have to hold it by the handle. And so I'm not going to drink the handle, but I'm going to drink the coffee. Uh, so, but handle helps me to get the cup to my mouth here. So the, the handles uh, help your people, uh, help your audience, all right, to get a grasp on your message. So you always start with the hook. Uh, what will capture the audience. And sometimes you'll find that uh, people tend to be, they have their own self-interest and therefore you have to uh, approach to their interests. 
like fish, they do not eat hamburger, but they do eat worms. And so you have to give worms, even though you yourself do not like worms. Like, for example, at one time when I preach to young people, I talk about computer games. Though I don't play the computer game, but I, I get to know the computer game that they uh, were then playing. And then I'm going to talk about it. And the very moment I did that, it broke the ice. Because they always got this idea that, you know, uh, you know this, the preacher always come and then they are very serious and all that. So I always try to break it down with, uh, with a joke and then I talk to each one of them. So this, this will be your, 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 your hook. And then that get you into the topic, and then you get into the word. Uh, already you got them interested, but because when you get into the word, they may not be able to fully understand the word, and therefore you give them illustrations. And so we say to you, illustrations are like windows, and so you need quite a few of them. And especially when the crowd is not mature, then you need more illustrations. There, there was a pastor who refused to use illustration. He said that uh, people will remember the illustration, but they don't remember the word of God. No, the illustration, like I said to you, uh, illustration is uh, like the handle, you know, so that uh, through the illustration, people tend to uh, remember the word of God. So like what Jesus did, he used the parables. And then after that, you can say, took means that you always have a take home value and then you always have a result, yeah? And we also talk about building blocks. Make sure, now a good preacher always built upon the last point. Uh, remember I told you some people, they just spin around and around on the same uh, point and so become very boring. So your point got to develop or describe the previous major point. And then we, we talk about some last I find this to be extremely important because I love people and I want to know, I want to know uh, how am I going to reach them. And I find that the best way to reach them is to have illustrations that relate to them. When I was in India, by the river, I used the river as an illustration and I talk more about farming. But before that, I actually read out about how Indian farmers, they did their farming. So that I wouldn't be talking about American farmers doing the farming. They have all the machine and all that. But Indian farmers, they depend upon their own two hands and the chunkle and so on and so forth. So, so you have to study the local, uh, uh, the, uh, local event and then find out how you can use as illustration. And so we say that it's a, uh, like a searchlight. It reveals the subject hidden in the shadow. And then we also talk about the chef. Remember the chef, he's serving turkey and he's able to serve turkey every day, but uh, by using different sauces, side dishes, and new dressing. So like, for example, we preach the gospel, salvation, 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 but yet we can preach, you know, like almost in every service, okay? And then we also talk about how do you get the illustration uh, the best one, of course, will be your own stories. And so some of you here, you have very nice story, like previously, you know, you drug addict, you murderer, uh, you mafia king or mafia boss. So while you're going through that, you didn't know that God was actually creating illustration for you. But one day when you become a pastor, then you can say, previously, I was a mafia boss. Ah, then you see, so that is your story. And so that served as illustration. And then you have, uh, ah, sometimes the truth, remember I told you 19 times, uh, Sister Selina wrote to me and said, Pastor, do you say 79 times? I say, no, I say 19 times. Then she say, wow, thank God, <laughs> 19 times. So, uh, not to worry, uh, certain truth and doctrine, you may have to repeat it, especially when you are pioneering a church and that you have people uh, who are with you, and then you have new uh, souls being saved, and therefore certain doctrine you repeat it. I think you have heard me talk about uh, the Holy Spirit. You heard about Pastor Ashok talking about Holy Spirit, uh, and then uh, you know Pastor Grace, Pastor Charlie, and the rest talking about Holy Spirit. It, it seems to be the same thing, but it is worth repeated. And then we also say don't have self worship as hero in our own eyes, and of course. 
all of us, we do have that. And therefore, we have to be very, very conscious about it. Now, if you say you don't have it, uh, then you watch again, all right? Uh, which means that when you preach a sermon, then you go back and you listen to yourself and you find that, oh dear, I've been talking about myself all the time. And then we also talk about power phrases. We talk about quotes. Uh, these are so very important because when you have a very simple sermon peppered with quotes and power phrases, you find that it is all the garnishes that you need. It enriches uh, your, your sermon and then it brings down to the level whereby people can understand. All right. So quote from well-known people will be very good. Uh, and then power phrases, uh, especially nowadays, fantastic. You just go to the internet and you have a lot of power phrases. Once again, we say jokes, poem, visual aids, props. And last week, we show you what Pastor Carlson did. Okay. And then you can use that also. Uh, or, or you can create your own. <clears throat> like at one time, uh, evangelist John Sung, if you have not heard about him, go to the internet and and type evangelist John Sung from China in the 1930s to the 1940s. And you'll find that uh, he used a lot of this kind of props. And one day, carried a small coffin on his shoulder, and then he brought the coffin in, and then he said that, I knew, I knew exactly when John Sung died. And so he showed the coffin, and he said that he... He was then in the coffin. He died to himself. Okay. All right. Then you have, uh, you can use video nowadays. In our church, we use quite a number of video. I use uh, video and then PowerPoints. I use a lot. Okay. Nowadays, I use a lot of PowerPoints, almost 100%. Okay. Like now, you see in this class, we are having PowerPoint. And then drama and skit. I am trying to move into drama and skit. Uh, so we need to talk to the young people and maybe some of the older ones who are very interested in drama and skit. But drama and skit will, will, will take a little bit more effort. But this one, once it's well done, it can be re repeated uh, in different uh, places, in the orphanages, in the church, in other churches, uh, you know, especially when you go on uh, a mission trip, then you can have this drama. At one time, I, 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 I wrote a, a, a skit that had been used uh, when I travel in the Philippines, and then my team continued to use that skit. Uh, and I re realized like in the Philippines, uh, one part of the skit said that the person dies. So we used the, the hook, you know, the hand. Uh, over, in, over in Singapore, die means like this, right? Do you use the same thing here? Right. Okay. So, so, but then in the Philippines, when we did this, they didn't understand. They didn't understand. So then I asked the pastor, how come when we do, when, when we did that, they didn't understand and they didn't laugh, you know, because it was supposed to be a joke. Uh, then he said they didn't understand. And so for them to die would be like this. This is that. Okay. So then when we changed that, everybody laughed. So, so you must also see that some of your non-verbals, and later on, we shall be talking more about the non-verbals. Uh, and also we talk about stage presence, and we are going to continue with, with, with that because this is absolutely important for you. The way you carry yourself, the way you walk on, uh, when people invite you to preach and how you walk up, and the importance of your non-verbal, and how do you handle spotlights. Remember, I said to you, if you don't like the spotlight, don't complain. All right, don't take, spend the first five minutes of your time complaining about the light and all that. I have seen some pastor actually ask me to turn off the spotlight. Yeah, all right. Because in our church in, in Singapore, we have 2,000 people. You know, our spotlight very strong. And this pastor actually asked me to turn that off. And I was, I tell you, I was visibly very upset. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> of course, I never invite him back again. <laughs> so, uh, never ask the pastor to turn off the spotlight. <clears throat> and last session, we talked about eye contact while preaching and uh, use a triangle method, remember? Uh, so, you look in the, in the front from, the, from your left, right across to the right, 
and then you cut across diagonally all the way to the back. So this one you need to practice and you normally practice this at home first, especially when you have been invited to a church that is, let's say, 500 in size. And then, which means that the hall will be pretty packed. But if you, if you are invited to a church that only 50 people, then it's a lot easier, a lot easier. Uh, but with, with a large church, 500 to 1,000 to 4,000, you, you'll find that you really, like when you go to a church preaching to 4,000, you literally have to walk. So you walk from this stage, from this side of the stage, you look at the people, you walk across there as you preach. So while you, all this becomes subconscious, it's like you're driving a car like that. But if you haven't practiced, then you find that you get stuck and you don't know what to do. And you are trying to use your conscious mind, the conscious mind up here in the, in the forefront, uh, the frontal lobe here, and you try to process at the same time you preach, that is a problem. So you always learn, practice this at home until it goes into the back of your mind, it becomes subconscious. Then automatically, when you preach, you just walk and you walk across, then you just look at the back and then you're back to the front. And then now from the center, you cut across to the back and then you, your eyes span across the back row and then you come back again. So this, you do it regularly. And then, of course, you don't do this all the time. There will be a time that you want to fix and you want to look at the particulars of the crowd. So it, depending on uh, how big the crowd is. But for most of you now, most probably, uh, the size that you'll be handling will be 100 to 200 people. Uh, but of course, I know that some of you one day will be handling 10,000, uh, a lot more, uh, praise God. So, but this will be a good a beginning. All right, now we talk about, uh, uh, again, now is how you uh, use your eyes. Uh, remember, the, your eye spanning across and that. But if you are using sermon note, what is the biggest danger? In those days, we didn't have the slides. And, and so what we do is that I notice many pastors because they are reading from their sermon notes. Now, I do not type my sermon notes. I, I wrote it with markers so that all the text were very large. And I use different color uh, so that I know what to highlight. And on every page of my sermon note, the number, the number is written in on the top right hand in a very big, means a marker put one, then it's one, two is two. You know why? Because sometimes when you go to a place when they do not have air condition and they have fans, and you put your sermon note and the very moment you open, it starts to fly off, the, uh, fly off. And then you want to gather your sermon notes. And if you put a number too small, very hard to gather. I'm doing this, uh, I'm, I'm saying this because I experienced that before. And then after when you gather your sermon notes together, then they're all jumbled up, mixed up. So do not be hurried. Uh, you, people have seen your sermon note being, flown, uh, being blown off the pulpit, and then they know that you have to gather. You can apologize, say, I'm sorry, I have to tidy my sermon note. Therefore, because all my numbers are very huge, easy to tidy. But you put in little corner, you know, this little thin pencil, you put one, or you are going to have be fr frustrated. All right. And then also uh, that if you if you uh, if you find that the, the fan is a bit strong here, we men have this heavy watch, all right? And then we take off the watch and we put it over the note. <laughs> So some of you guys, when you are preaching, you 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 might do you might have to carry, uh, you might have to wear a, a watch. Then you have good eye contact with the audience. Just now we we said so, and then of course then when you preach, you make your per, your sermon personal by this eye contact. Now sometimes uh, in the church, I may like to call some of you by name, you know, and then. Especially when I see that you are going to fall asleep, and then I say, "Hey, brother, so and so, what do you think about this?" And then you will wake, wake up. But of course, in other other uh, churches, you you don't do that. All right. An effective preacher does not just preach with his or her mouth, but with the whole body, with the whole body. All right. Uh, 
uh, there's a mistake there. So it's not their whole body, but the whole body. So uh, you find that during this time uh, lockdown, you know, when you have to use Zoom, uh, though you can't see me, my whole body is moving. <laughs> but this hand is all moving uh, because I speak with my hand. All right. And I, I pray that all of you will learn how to use your hand to communicate. Okay. So communicating uh, God's truth always through personality. Now, some people got this wrong idea, you know, like that I'm trying to teach you how to be me. That is the least. Uh, you, you can never be me because I'm uniquely me. All right. You have to be you. But you can see that some of my techniques and some of my preaching style, if you were to meet my pastor, Pastor Naomi Dowdy, you will find that I learned a lot from her. Because I've been with her for many years. And I've been her assistant uh, pastor. And she preached every week. And I've been watching her. And some of the words that I use, some of the vo vocab that I use, and I noticed also, you know, like Pastor Grace has been with me for many years now. And then when she preached and she had been using some of my words, and I say, oh, they've been using <laughs> power phrases from me. And I said, ah, good student. But you definitely, you can be assured, Pastor Grace doesn't sound like me or look like me or even act like me. All right. So I pray that you find your own style and don't think that you can just imitate a person. For example, one, one pastor in, in America, he was a very powerful uh, preacher, but he got a stiff leg, you know, stiff leg. That is, uh, his leg was uh, uh, broken and then he couldn't bend his leg. So whenever he, he watched, I mean, when he preached, he walked. When he walked, he would swing his leg like this, swing stiff, stiff like that, right? He would swing his leg. And later on, he produced many of the students when they preached, they will swing their leg like that. Why? Because they were learning to be like him. Uh, then I heard also there was one Chinese uh, preacher, and every time when he preached, and he will, uh, he will suck in air like, "Sir, <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know." So you you hear this up. Then all the students that he trained up preach like that, "Sir, you know. But what they didn't realize was that the, the pastor and the teacher was actually having denture. So when he got denture, when he preached the denture, in, in, in those old days, the denture wanted to fall out. So he was sucked in. He was sucked in. And then, so when you see, uh, we tend to imitate too closely. So don't. Uh, what you do here is that, of course, uh, learn, learn some of the basic principles, learn some of the techniques, and then subsequently uh, develop your own style because you have to be you, all right? And so is communicating, uh, communicating God's truth through personality. Your personality means that you have to develop your own style. Uh, you can learn from other preachers, but you still have to develop your own preaching style. So I'm emphasizing this because sometimes people have this wrong idea that when you come to... A, a homiletic class, you must learn from the Sifu, you know. No, no, no. You have your own style, okay? And when a preacher's words and body language do not align, the audience will respond to the body language more so than to the verbal language. So if you say, you remember uh, 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 when, when you say, uh, there's an old game called Simon Say. I, I don't know you are uh, you young people have, have played this or not. And when Simon say, touch your nose, touch your nose, then, you, then they all touch your nose. And Simon say, pull your ear, pull your ear, and all that. But then when you say, when Simon say, touch your nose, then you pull the ear, you find everybody will follow you pulling ear, even though you say, touch the nose. All right, because you, you see what happened here is that the word is not as powerful as the action. So nonverbal, actually nonverbal is something that you need to learn. And so when you go up and, and preach, the very moment you walk up and you stand behind the pulpit is that, are you coming across as a proud 
uh, person and then your action you know and then the way you look at the people and the way you greet the people all these but all these are best expressed through your non verbal okay so but the the best thing that you can do is your verbal the communication and the non verbal they coordinate very well they come in alignment all right when you go on stage uh, some of this posture you must be careful like uh, slouching you know or you are very stiff because you are very tense or you are too relaxed some of you are very cool you know you go there you are like uh, you know uh, they, they call it the cool hand you you know you are you're like wow so relaxed you know uh, or you become very cautious or that when you open up and begin to to share you sound very boring so stage posture very important I pray that in homolytic 2, if some of you can come back, uh, we are going to talk more about it. And then in homolytic 2, it's not so much on lecture, but more so on practicum, which means that uh, you are going to be preaching and I'm going to tell you, hey, you know, or I'm going to watch your video and I'm going to give you uh, all the comments. But some of us here uh, must be very careful is that when the comments are being made, right? Do not be offended <laughs> because some of them are very sensitive. We don't like people to, to, to tell us, yeah? All right, so uh, now this is an Indonesian uh, pastor. Uh, she is a good friend of my pastor. And uh, she is a very good uh, lady preacher and having a sizable church in Jakarta, I believe. And so you can see that she is very relaxed right she's not very rigid right and then the shoulder back the shoulder is back for me because of a handicap so i'm hunched but those of you who have no handicap please don't follow me all right uh, uh, even when i'm hunched you you find that how do i straighten myself when i stand there and i'm hunched i use my leg means that i bend one knee i bend one knee so that i could stand straight so that if you look at some of my video, you find that when I stand, I will have to bend one knee so that I can be straight. But if not, then you see that I'm 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 stoop. So so you know your handicap here, and then you try to make adjustment. But if you are a normal person, you know, then make sure your shoulder back, your shoulder back. Then also something that I don't like about some American uh, preachers is like, they like to put their hand in the pocket, you know. And in Asia, this kind of attitude is like pride. And especially when you go to Korea and you go to some of these more conservative uh, places, and then you walk around with, you know, you preach around as though. And so, of course, this is Chuck uh, Swindle. I like his book a lot. And, and, and I also listen to his uh, uh, sermon but i noticed that he always like to do that the hand in the pocket so i suggest uh, this is my recommendation to all uh, preachers avoid hand in the pocket or the hand on the hip you know so sometimes you 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 stand there and then when you preach and because you have this uh, lapel mic you know and, and the mic over here and so you put your hand on your hip and so that all this non-verbal will portray pride or maybe you are talking down to a person and understand that we are in asia all right we are in asia and therefore we have to take note of some asian uh posture okay? oh at at one time uh, uh a missionary and his wife almost got into trouble with the Thai, uh, Thai church. What happened was that they were at this village and they were, uh, everybody sat on the, on the floor, okay? And the, the missionary, he was invited to be the preacher and his wife was sitting next to the other uh, uh, people. And then when she got up, what happened was that she did not fold her skirt she didn't fold her skirt and put it, you know, squeeze it between her leg and walk. She walked, she stood up and walked like any, any American lady and her skirt swept the head of the Thai men. And some of those Thai men who came, they were not Christian. They came to hear the gospel 
and when the skirt swept over their head, there was commotion, and they were so, uh, you know, so unhappy. You know, they were saying that you know you are uh, bad luck and so on. And and so, be very careful uh, when you go and uh, let's say you preach in another country. What the pastor does, you do. If he sit down, you watch how he sit down. If he never cross his leg, you never cross your leg. Okay, because in Korea, if you cross your leg, you kill car. You know, you cross your leg. That's very rude, especially when you sit on the stage. But I've seen American; they just come and 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 cross leg. All right, and and so a lot of things can be very offensive. Uh, like for example, when you go to uh, the to China or you go to to Japan and you are teaching, you are teaching. American uh, lecturer like to sit on the table, right? So they they jump on the table, they sit, and then very casual, they they start to lecture. And if that happened in Japan and that happened in China or Taiwan or even in Singapore, you find that uh, the student will be very a bit irritated because why? Because the people cannot put the batok on the table. <laughs> That's the culture. And then, uh, so while you are teaching, 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 and all the time they are watching your batok, because you got your batok on the table. You see, so you got to be very careful and to check, you know, uh, all this the cultural track. All right, uh, cross arm. Now, unless you are doing a, a sermon illustration, then you can cross arm, yeah? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> or, you, or you claps your hand, you know, as you begin to talk, and then you keep doing this, you keep doing this. Uh, it can show that you are nervous or you're uncertain, you know, uh, or you are not sure of the doctrine. And therefore, you are doing like this. So all this are actually gesture, not so much posture, yeah. And then now, if you want to use those like cross arm and all that, because you want to communicate that, then it's fine. Uh, you know, uh, like like for example, when uh, David when he met Goliath, he said, you know, he, then he crossed his arm like that. I'm not afraid of you. So you you can do that, and so that is something like a sermon illustration. Uh, so it's okay if you want to use it, but don't do it for yourself because then you will come across as proud. But I, I've seen, I've seen uh, when during question and answer time, uh, this American lecturer, uh, he actually crossed his arm like that. And so we were students and we watched him. And then in my mind, I was thinking that he is like, put, he was then like putting a barrier between him and us. Because he's like defending himself, because we are going to question him. So you have to check your yourself. So if you are nervous, you want to cross arm, tell yourself, put your arm down. All right? Put your arm down. Okay? Some of them do this halfway, they cross halfway. <laughs> so whatever ways, try not to create nonverbal a barrier between you and the audience. And then emphasis, okay? So that you find that uh, you move back, forth, left, right. So moving forward means something, and moving backward means uh, so you lean forward, lean backward. There's a lateral movement, left, right, too. And so uh, as you begin to 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 preach, this is this one. No one can really teach you, but only when you preach more often, then you find that your sermon will flow. Your sermon will flow. And your body will flow, your body gesture will flow with your sermon. All right? Like now when I, when I teach you, you see my hand, I didn't have to think about it. I uh, say I didn't have to think about it. You see how the hand automatically starts to wave. Okay? So all this gesture that you practice, and then of course when you're on stage, then it becomes wider. But when you are like now I'm facing this, computer here, this laptop here, so I have to make it very small, <laughs> okay? So, now, then you, you can act out something, later on I will show you, 
uh, because your your hand your hand actually forms shape actually will point uh, the direction of things and so you actually would act out <coughs> and then you uh, imitate what you are emphasizing and then some of you here you need to have facial expression okay nothing wrong to to even come across that you look like a clown is fine but you need to have facial expression yeah all right good gesture will be like what is natural because it's you so that's why i say you cannot be me you have to be you and so you have to allow the holy spirit to bring out what is naturally given to you and how do you express yourself if this is the way you normally talk then talk like that and then always make sure that there's um in your sermon there is uh there is a certain energy kind of a force behind it and so you don't slur you don't say oh god love you you know jesus love you and i love you but you have to have emphasis you know and you say and i can tell you god loved you you know things like that so these are called energetic and then it must be well timed and also uh, that of course you are visible <laughs> sometimes it's like that i saw one pastor uh he's he was then very very short and so uh his daughter came with him so i look at the pulpit because the pastor said he always preached from the pulpit and if he preached from the pulpit then all you could see would be just the eye you know because he's very short he's like almost like four feet and and he was very short. <laughs> then i was wondering am i supposed to give him a chair so he can stand there you know because he wanted to preach from the pulpit oh thank god was that his daughter came prepared because the daughter carry a box a box as a platform and the very moment you should put the box there and then he he was as tall as all of us all right you got to be seen uh no point i can just hear your voice i got to see you and then of course your gesture also got to be varied and uh, visible also means that from the back people can see my gesture so if i'm going to say uh, uh east from east to the west i have to stretch out i so you cannot use the gesture like now i'm facing the camera east to the west all right now here is billy sunday one of the most dynamic preachers of all time he was a baseball player and then later on god called him into the ministry and so uh he always liked to lean forward and uh, some of the some of the photo that uh, had been left behind i would see that he's full of action he's a man of action because he was a sportsman and so he's very dynamic yeah so uh so for for example when i lean forward and i use a mic and i whisper but not really whispering loud enough for you to hear means i want to share a secret all right means i lean forward means i'm near you all right so even though you can have 1000 people and then you find you lean forward then up there the on the display screen you actually will lean forward and the camera will pick that up but let's say you're in a small church of 50 when you lean forward it means a lot all right means i'm going to share with you a secret or you lean forward and you emphasize like that you when you lean forward like that means that i'm giving you a double emphasis mean boom boom and i say to you then you lean forward all right so this leaning lateral movement all this you may have to practice instead of just standing there like a you know piece of wood and not moving uh it, it's not going to work you 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 have to move all right and and then you see this is how uh, these are some of the pictures that i capture of Billy Sunday and this is uh, can you do it like this or not <laughs> all right so some of you here uh, during your sermon uh, when you videotape it I want to see some of this action uh, you know flying uh, <laughs> okay and then uh, he even climbed up on the pulpit and preached all right because he was uh, suspecting that people at the back can't see him and he will climb up but these are pictures that he posts. Uh, this is for the posters. But that is what you do. You can see the, the top one where he leaned forward. 
and then he will raise his fist and all that. So he is a, a very vigorous uh, preacher. Some of you are not. So you, you, you find your, your, your way. For example, uh, our, the founder of Foursquare, Amy McPherson, is also, if you watch some of her video, dynamic but very sweet. Not like this. This is very aggressive, but very dynamic, but very sweet. All right. Now, hand gesture. There's no such thing as a neutral gesture. Whether you want to gesture, you say that I'm neutral, I put my hand by my side. That is a gesture by itself. So everything you do with your hands communicate something. Now, when you just put your hand by your side and then you just speak like that, then it tells people that you are inexperienced. It tells people that not to take your sermon seriously because you can't even present yourself. All right? Make sure your hands are not giving a speech in competition with the one you are preaching. All right? You are saying something, but your hand is doing something. All right? Then you say, and that, you know, and Jesus calm the sea, you know, then this is, then you are making like that. Uh, this is not so calm, right? So if I would say Jesus calm the sea, then I slow down. Then that makes, makes sense. But because in your mind, you see think of storm, Jesus calm the sea. Now, people say, now is it calming or is it confusing or what? You see, so it's very important for you. And then uh, you must practice your hand movement uh, now, this is something that I, I, I treat it very seriously because communication is very vital. And, and don't treat this nonverbal thing like, you know, it's like a side light, means I light or I can tell you whether you are a welcome preacher or not. It may depend upon whether your hands and your movement flow along with your sermon. And this coordination need practice. And don't say, oh, it's okay. The Holy Spirit will guide me. Uh -uh. The Holy Spirit may give you the gift of music, but you still have to practice on piano. You still have to practice. And so if the pianists, they have to practice their gift, you have to practice your gift too. You cannot say, I'm so gifted. Oh, that's pride, you know. I'm so gifted. I have no need to practice. I'm natural. Oh, please. I've seen some people fail was because they did not practice. And then pointing with fingers, again, you, you see, American like to point with these fingers. And maybe in Malaysia and Singapore, we can point like that. But uh, in some country, you cannot point like that. And it means that the finger is sticking out and it's bad. So what you do is that you use the whole hand. Okay. And then you watch it also. It's worse. In some places, when you show the palm is bad. So you don't say, and there's one God. <laughs> that is like, oh dear. Maybe he's cursing me. You know? Uh, so then also when you bless uh, people, there are way to bless. Some places they bless like this, means they're not full palm, but like this. So you have to find out what the pastor is doing, and then you, you learn. So, I mean, I've been doing this for many years, but I, every time when I go to a place, I humble myself, and I don't assume I, I knew anything about the culture. For example, I preach in India. Did you realize that in Bangalore and in Mangalore and in Gujarat and in Goa, different, different. Uh, we were preaching in Goa. And as I said, let us pray. I expected the ladies to put their scarf on, right? Amen. The, the veil, the veil. No, in Goa, no. They pray without veil. But in every place we went, they were put on veil, right? Then, of course, in some mo modern places, absolutely not even the, the, the veil. So different parts of India will have different culture, and you have to be very careful. Same with China. Different parts of China will have different. So I preached in Shanghai will be different from Beijing and will be different from maybe in Wuhan. And so you have to always ask. Be humble and ask. Don't make assumptions. Assumption is a bad word. And then, and, and, and then when, when, when you talk about giving, receiving, all these are gesture, rejection, pushing, anger, clenched fist, all this you have to practice until it becomes like second, uh, second nature. All right. Then you draw pictures with your hand, means that, for example, action, action. So 
Saul threw a spear at David. You see, he threw a spear. So this is an action. All right. So you must make sure that the, the action is vigorous. Vigorous because he's throwing a spear. Don't say and 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 so through through a, a, a spear. Now you do like that. I mean, what kind of spear is this? Uh, throwing a toothpick, you see. So you have to do it. That out of your belly shall flow rivers. You see, rivers of living waters. You make wave with your hand. So all this you need to you need to practice. All right. Then shape <laughs> shape form the shape. For example, God created the whole earth, whole earth, with his word alone. So you see, so the whole earth is round. Or you can say, and Virgin Mary became pregnant, pregnant, and you see the pregnant, so with a child, okay? And there were cloven tongues as a fire, cloven tongues as a fire. So all this, you figure out how you can do it, and so it becomes very natural for you. Now, uh, when you when you count something, you always show numbers with your hand. For example, there were four men. At first, they threw in three men, but there were four in the furnace. Okay, so now you are showing four. So always use your hand for numbers. And then um, here is the second reason. All right, number two. Here's the second reason why we need the Bible. And then you can hear one by one, one by one. Okay. Now, means that you are using your whole hand, but you are counting like, like as though there are people there. One by one, the enemies were destroyed by the Lord. So you are going one by one. So all this you need to uh, know and need to practice. All right. Then position. For example, Elijah was caught up. All right. He was caught up. So, so your, your hand show like something being caught up to heaven. Now, where is heaven? Heaven is up there, right? So, so you point heaven in a chariot of fire. So you keep pointing to heaven. All right. Then when we say Jesus sits on the right hand, then you show your right hand. Now people understand when you show your right hand is their left hand. Okay. All right. And then if you want to emphasize, then you can say some of the preachers like to say, uh, Jesus sits on which hand, right hand or left hand? Show me. And then they get a whole church to show right hand. So that is uh, involvement. Sometimes when you find that when people get bored, then you want to involve. When do you involve? You see bottom. When you see that maybe you are droning, droning, droning. And then, okay, do not hide the lamp under the table, right? Under the table. Here you show something. So position, you use hand. Okay? And then, uh, for, for example, you charge forward, right? You retreat backwards. So you use hand to show uh, what's going on. And then you also show emotion. Like for example, Jesus was angry when he saw the temple being used for the wrong purpose. He was so angry. So you, you can shake your, your fist or whatever uh, nonverbal action that your culture would allow. Okay. I do not know. Maybe some of the culture say angry means they tear the hair or, or, or punch someone. All right? Then when you say Jesus wept, then you say tears come down. And Jesus wept. You see? And of course, when you say Jesus wept, you must lower your tone. So later on, we learn intonation, very important also. Now, all these are theories just for you. But you got to practice. It doesn't mean that you, you watch this video and then you immediately you know how to do it. It's like me trying to teach you how to ride a bicycle. And showing you the theory and then you think, oh, I know how to ride the bicycle. And then you go and ride a bicycle and you fall down. Okay? So you still have to practice. So all these different emotion, you know, fear, anger, you know, and, and various aspect of uh, doubt and so on and so forth all this you have to watch how the preachers are doing and then whether you can learn from them or not now when preaching in a foreign land all right be sure like i've said again and again to acquaint yourself with the local culture ask the local pastor if you are not sure what to expect uh, this picture here uh, i was preaching in 
Bangladesh in the village of uh, Darabasai. Yeah, that, and, and you find that among the crowd, there are people from other religions. And so I have to be very careful what I say and how I say things. But good thing is that because of the interpreter and he was a very experienced pastor. And so even when I said wrong, you know, he would make it right. Yeah. And then uh, also be prepared to change your communication style. Like a lot of time, uh, my, when, when in this place, you find that my nonverbal become less distinct because I kept watching the pastor. What was his nonverbal? Then when I picked up, when I picked up, and then when he began to do things like this, then I follow, all right? But when he moved his head, I can't, you know. When he say yes, I, I, I can't, I got stiff neck, <laughs> all right. All right, I'm going to show you some of the thing that seems perfectly innocent for us, but it can be a problem in another country. For example, this is okay. Okay for us is okay, right? But then you find in France, it means zero or worthless. So when, when uh, the person say, how, uh, how do I look? You say zero, you're worthless. <laughs> so you cause the person to be offended. Or in Brazil, it's actually a vulgar sign, all right? It's a vulgar sign. So be very careful when you go to Brazil. I must remember because I've been invited to Brazil, but I haven't gone there yet. Uh, but I have to be very careful not to use this. <laughs> so avoid this gesture uh, when preaching in uh, Greece or Turkey or Brazil or in the Middle East. Uh, you are calling a person a homosexual or a pervert. Okay. Then here is good, you know, in, in, you know, most of us say good, even in China, when I say good, they, they will say good. Most of the modern people will understand it's good. But in some places like Iran, Afghanistan, and Greece, it means sit on it, sit on it. So it means the middle finger, all right? So especially your uh, ladies, don't use this when you are over there. Uh, so men uh one pastor said that when he did that uh i think he was in one of the middle eastern countries and he said when he did that he realized that the people were very unhappy and because he didn't know because he did he made an assumption that everybody understood what he meant all right <clears throat> excuse me management of vocal expression uh, because we use the word, so you find that uh, Peter, uh, Peter actually said, uh, brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips, right? My lips, the message of the gospel and believe. And so from that time on, you find that uh, the gospel is being preached through words that is expressed through uh, the, the, the mouth, yeah? Uh, so the vocal expression. All right, I want you to take note of this one. This one, um, we may have to uh, train you. Uh, those of you who actually learn how to sing, you should know that whenever you uh, sing, you use your diaphragm, all right? And how do you use a diaphragm is that you breathe in until your stomach is like bloated, okay? And then you let the air out, you let the air out. So uh, by using your diaphragm, you find that I can continually uh, teach, you know, in a, in a camp or in a seminar for a few days and will not lose my voice because uh, it's not the vocal cord. Now, some of you here, now the... <clears throat> The Orientals like us, uh, the Chinese especially, you find that when we talk, we squeeze our vocal cord here so that you find that after that it's very tired. But for the Westerner and for Filipino, they know how to let it go, let it go, brothers. So, see? They didn't use the vocal cord. And a lot of expression is being done with the tongue and the teeth and the lips here. So. Uh, some of the people can sing for hours because they are singing here, 
and not here. And they use the diaphragm to push out the air. And so this one, uh, you need a specialist to teach you. I'm not a specialist, but I learned it by myself so that I, uh, I could be able to preach for a long time. But I still, uh, after, you know, for extra long preaching, like a long mission trip, then you find that my vocal cord, it does get uh, uh, exhausted. And, and also, uh, all the technique of how you enunciate and all that, I, I can't teach you here, but uh, you have to learn by yourself. And then I think on the uh, YouTube, you can actually see how people uh, will show you how to, uh, how you use your mouth and use your lips and, and teeth and tongues for diction. And so voice is a power language. Why? Because you have tone, you have intonation, and you have a secondary language. For example, when you say yes in a very firm way, or you say yes, uh, then you see, that 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 sound uh, that yes may be the, the same yes, but how you say it, uh, it will come across different meaning. All right, and uh, you will find that Charles Spurgeon said, "Remember when you lift up your voice like a trumpet, that you also recall the injunction, do thyself no harm." Now, how many of you have seen uh, preachers, right? They are uh, yellow, you know, they, they, they scream, scream a lot. They scream to a point whereby uh, no more voice, you know, they, they actually destroy the vocal cord. And so they will come out very coarse, very coarse. So don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, learn how to throw your voice. There was a pastor in Malaysia when I first came, uh, he didn't know how to throw his voice. And so uh, he would eat his voice, you know, means that he, he would speak, but the but the sound would ha happen in inside his mouth, not outside his mouth. So then, then the complaint was that uh, this pastor is mumbling, mumbling. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me. In my in my training, I asked him to to open his mouth and I asked him to say ha ha and keep doing it, keep doing it until he he could throw out his voice. And then I say, okay, now talk like that, preach like that. And so now he's preaching like that. So now he's more acceptable, yeah. So the four powers of your voice, uh, the compass of your voice, the volume of your voice, the penetration of your voice, and the melody of the voice. So I'm going to go through this with you. What's the compass, right? It's the range of pitch over which your voice extends. Uh, you know, uh, how many of you know Brother Don? You know Br Brother Don, our Brother Don, right? Huh? Wow, his, his pitch can go really high. Uh, sometimes he will, he will switch to that very high pitch when he sing a song, and none of us can, uh, can sing along, all right? Because you're like, oh, because he got this baritone or so, or whatever that is. Yeah. So, and sometimes I, in some occasion, I changed my voice. And so I began to preach like this. Especially when I am in a big crowd, I have to preach like this. So that all my enunciation will be in the front of my mouth here. And no engagement of the vocal cord at all. All right? And so I can sing song, oh, oh, oh you know. So, and so you have to practice. You have to practice. And then the volume of the voice is the extent of the tone produced by the vocal cord. That you have a very strong, rich voice. Every time when you preach, you have a strong, rich voice. But if you have a very thin voice, and then you start to preach, and then you find that you do need to have vocal exercises to enrich that thin voice. And, and how do you know thin voice and all that? Only the voice expert can tell you. But I can tell you in my own experience is that I have to have, means that I have to have air in my throat and air in my mouth. All right, means that there must be air. And then when I speak, I am speaking like this. And so on Sunday, I actually would speak like this. 
on Sunday, not like here, because I'm talking to this, but on Sunday when I have to preach, you find my voice start to change and it become rich. So, and Jesus said that God loves you. So, but all this you need to practice, uh, you know, nobody can succeed for you and nobody can fail for you. If the more you practice, the better it is. I, I, I see some of you are already trying to practice and that's good, that's good. Uh, you can look at, you, you, you can tape it down, you can tape it down and then you, you listen before you enrich, before you fill your mouth with air and then and speak and then after you fill your mouth with air and speak and you find different. And the penetration of the voice is the distance by which your audience can hear you. It's not the loudness, but the, the pitch that at the back there, they, they can hear. So uh, like, like a child voice may not be loud, but it can penetrate, means it can be heard much uh, further away. In fact, one of our practices in Bible school was that uh, we were not allowed to use mic. And then we would stand in front of the church and the lecturer would go to the back of the church. And so the, the, the church can sit about two, 300 uh, people. And so you find that it is like the length of the whole house. Uh, so like your house, like let's say you, 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 you get your loved one to stand in the kitchen and you are right there at the front door. And then you speak. And if your loved one in the kitchen can hear you, then you find that the penetration of your voice is there. And for a lady preacher, uh, you have to be very careful because uh, when you get excited, your voice become very uh, uh, shrill, you know, yeah, you know, and then sometimes people are slain in the spirit, not because of the Holy Spirit, it's because of your voice. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So you, so you have to be very careful. But my pastor, my pastor preached like a man because she got very low voice. And if you were to talk to her on the phone, you thought that you are talking to a man. Okay. Uh, but now she's older and her, her voice has, uh, the recent time I heard her uh, speaking and her voice has changed. But when she was younger, you, you find a very rich voice, very rich and very powerful. Okay, so uh, practice on that. Then the melody of the voice is the flexibility of the tone. And so that you can go high, low, almost like sing song, okay? And there's a sweetness in your voice. And so when you begin to preach very fast or you want to uh, uh, move on uh, at, uh, at a particular speed, you know, and you want to say that, and he loves you more and more and more, right? So then how are you going to put this uh, across so that you don't want it to be the the the... the the same tone or, or, or the, uh, how do you say, um, I, I don't have the word for, for it, but that you want to go up and down and he loves you more and much more and more. So you, you can change. So these are discrete vocal uh, emotion. Now, like I, like I said here, because these are in another field, whereby the vocal expert will be able to teach you and if you are interested. But the best thing you can do is experiment it by yourself and then get somebody to bounce back the idea, you know. And then uh, the person that you entrust to bounce back idea must be willing to hurt you. Must be telling you, hey, you sound horrible <laughs> or something like that. Uh, but if you got somebody who, you know, uh, let's say this is your boyfriend and he loves you a lot and you really sound horrible and he said oh it's so sweet it's so sweet then he will give you the wrong feedback then you will you will sound horrible for the rest of your life all right so it's important for you to get somebody uh, to give you feedback but if you want me to give you feedback i assure you you will get my honest truth and after that you will hate me but that's fine i am used to being ha hated but I will tell you, I say, if it's good, it's good. It's not good, it's not good. It's not good, I say. And maybe some of you, I say, I, I think you better go and learn how to talk again. All right, so, so now there are three uh, pitches that we have. And so you've got a high pitch, right? 
Ah, uh, so it's da da da. All right. Ah, uh, so you always when you begin, never begin with low pitch, right? I mean da da. Don't start with the low 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 pitch, but you start with the middle pitch. Okay. So you 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 find out your your range, and some of you can go very very high. For for example, like I said, uh, you know, brother Don, he can he can go so really high. But don't start with that too, because you start with that, then it's it's gonna hurt the 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 ear. You only go on to the high high pitch was because when you uh, anticipate something exciting and then you can go, and then also the speed must follow up with your with your pitch. So remember, always go middle middle, and then you find your middle. Ask your your friend, ask your loved one. You know, how do you like me to start? Okay. So again, like this is this is really not my area of expertise, but I must let you know. And then uh, for for myself, it's always that I discover it by myself, and then I learn a lot of things. I can tell you, the Bible school will, will not teach you uh, because they themselves don't even know. Uh, but what you do here is that if you really want to hone your your skill, you want to train yourself up. You really have to learn beyond the Bible school. It means beyond this course, you will continue to go and find out what is the best way. But uh, what we can do, or what I can do for you here, is that I can give you feedback. And then, if let's say when you preach a sermon and you let me hear on YouTube and I watch on YouTube and I see all the action, then I can give you an honest uh, feedback. But that will be only my opinion. Maybe another pastor may say, "Oh, this is no good." But I may like it, you know. So, so uh, you may show different pastors, but make sure that you show people who have at least some experience in uh, preaching. And so here are just something that you can use the way of preaching, like you can use pauses. Uh, so that, that uh, but some of you are very natural because uh, when when you hesitate. Uh, when you feel like uh, you are going through the valley and then you are waiting upon God, then you pause. It's natural for you. It's like natural. All right. And, and that's good. Which means yeah, you have a gift thing there. And so now we need to polish it up and make you much better. And then you have stress on words like certain emphasis. Okay. And then you. You see, when the when the devil he told me, he said I should rob the bank, but I said no, no, no. Stress on word, okay? Stress, okay? No, no, no. But then you see, just now what I did was that I did a very high pitch here. So so sometimes it may not be very nice for the ear, okay? So you may want to lower it, but it's up to you. Uh, you have to find your own way uh, because. God give you your body. God give you your all your uh, all the faculties. You need to use up. Then when to speed up, when to slow down, and then lower volume, and sometimes grunts. And now be very careful <coughs> how you use grunts. All right, grunts are actually uh, meaningless sound. Meaningless sound. Okay, and you can go ha, you can go hu, you can go boo, whatever that you use, and you make sure that it's appropriate, okay? So, uh, and Goliath, when he saw David, and he go, who, who is afraid of this stupid little boy? You know, so you create something. And then now people start to see picture. Now, when you preach, always remember you are an artist, you are painting word, word picture for your audience to see. Now, if you always say that, oh, you know, I'm an abstract preacher, you know, I, I only talk philosophy and logic, then you find that you are not a teacher, but you are a philosopher or you are a teacher, okay? And so you are talking very abstract thing, very boring stuff. But even when you, I when 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 I taught uh, systematic uh, uh, theology, a lot of very abstract thing, but I try to bring in some pictures so that you can see, but still it could be very tough. All right. What about the speed of sermon? Uh, the expert says there's about 120 up to 160 words per minute. So you can try and see. You can 
you can count or you can go to my sermon and you can count it and see in one minute how many words I, I speak. All right. Or you can go to other pastors and, 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 and watch. All right. So that's consider normal speed. But you find that you cannot have this consistent normal speed all the time. All right. So you have to learn how to vary your speed. Even now when I'm talking to you, I'm not going to have it same speed all the time. All right. I have to learn how to vary and then so slow down to emphasize a point. Like what I just did. Slow down. All right, and then I pause for impact. Okay. So for the speed of the sermon, remember it's not all fast. It may have to be slowed down and then put on the brake, pause, and then speed on. So when you speed up, is to show intensity, show passion, show enthusiasm. And so Mary he, she ran back. She ran back, her heart beating so rapidly. She had seen the Lord and she wanted to tell. She wanted to tell everybody, I've seen the Lord. So you speed up, but you paint word picture. Okay. Now, Alfred P. Gibbs, uh, this is, uh, he is one of the authors of uh, a uh, preaching book. Yeah. And that's my textbook when I was in Bible school. And he said, begin low, all right? Not low tone, but begin low, then go slow, rise higher, take fire, wax warm, sit down in the storm. <laughs> okay. Begin low. And the children of Israel, they were on the verge of entering the promised land and god has given them this promised land as promised to their forefather abraham right so low slow letting the background and now they are at this place called kadesh Barnea, and god said to them i want you to send 12 spies into the land and these 12 spies were all young men young leaders of the tribe leaders each one from each tribe 12 tribes 12 leaders and they went they crossed the border and they went into the promised land and wow they saw the land flowing with milk and honey so what happened here is that now the picture is being formed people are following you people has crossed the land with you all right i mean cross the river with you and they're now in the promised land and then, then you go into the descriptive mode, okay? And then when you say they began to, to uh, they met the giant, then, you know, the crescendo, the music, dun -dun 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 -dun, rising higher, okay? And that's why uh, in, in, in some uh, churches, what they, what they did was that the pastor and the musician, they cooperate. When I was in Pittsburgh, where the, the pastor and the musician, right? they were working uh, together every time when the pastor will go into this excitement mode the musician will follow with a very fast beat. all right and then when the pastor slow down then the musician will go, dun, 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 dun. the musician and the pastor flow, flow along but in our church the mu mu musician just play what they want to play like you know so i'll preach what i want to preach so uh, we haven't come to that level yet. one day we will do that okay uh, then you you wax warm was that now the people are in the picture they are sitting down with you like in the fireplace already and then when you even when you create a, a big storm right these people stay put right they are going to watch what you are going to say okay okay all right let me go to the next one <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, be mindful of your personal appearance. In our church, we like to dress formal. That even uh, when I'm teaching, you see, I put on something with a collar. Uh, but some churches, they don't care, you see. 
some of the pastors will go on the stage with round collar t-shirt or just white. Uh, in Australia, I saw one pastor, he preached without shoe and he was wearing the shorts, huh? just white shorts like my grandfather's underwear like that. Yeah. And then the white t-shirt like from China, you know, the Seagull brand. And then he went up to preach like, like that. And I was like, oh. So, but to him, that is, uh, so, your, so your personal appearance tell you who you are. Now, he wants to say that, you know, he is full of freedom. Maybe one day he might not wear any clothes to go up. I, I don't know, because he's full of freedom. But to me, is that when on Sunday, you have to put on your Sunday best. And so Dr. Ravi Zachariah, I, I like every time he, he came and when he preached for us in, in our church in Singapore, wow, well attired, you know, suit, tie and all that. Okay. But of course now there are new 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 ways whereby they don't wear tie or they just put on a jacket or they put on something. So so we will try to adapt to the new culture as long as it is not uh, you know not rude and not uh, vulgar. So you, you should be neat, clean, and appropriately dressed. Now it's very important for you, all of you who are preachers, uh, make sure that your breath, your take care of your breath, okay. Uh, you have to uh, have some mint in your back. Uh, be before you preach, maybe you should chew some chewing gum or, or mint. Mint is the best because uh, you can swallow. Chewing gum, you can't swallow. Uh, so if the pastor calls you up, then you still have chewing gum in your mouth. All right? So why? Because at the end of the service, you have to minister. So if you, if you never really, like, for example, you... you you reach the place and then you haven't got time to brush your teeth and you haven't got a uh, chance for us men to shave. We got the five o'clock shadow. Imagine when, uh, when I was in India, they drove us, they didn't allow us to have uh, a time to rest. At night, we actually slept in the car. They drove us to the next place. And then when we reached that place, it was 9 a.m. in the morning. And I, I didn't even shave. Whole night, uh, all I did was that I asked the pastor, let me brush my teeth. Because why? Because I don't want the people to be slain in the Holy Spirit because I didn't brush my teeth. All right? Means I go lay hand on them, then they're all slain. So we don't want that. All right? Now I, I still want to be a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of this beard is okay. But at least I'm, I'm fresh, I'm clean. Yeah? Appearance, uh, you see, for ladies, are uh, you ladies uh, preacher? Now this is this is stylish. I like this, you know, very nice. Uh, and also, you make sure that for your lady preacher, don't wear, uh, uh, you know, a dress whereby uh, when you bend down, everything will be exposed. All right, because you know what? After that, you need to pray for people, and then people will be slain and all that. Then you need to bend down and all that. So what you do, you wear like this. You wear like this. Up to the collar is the best. Okay. So there's no fear of exposure or anything. So your choice of color. Okay. Don't wear psychedelic. You know what? Psych psychedelic colors. Don't 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 wear those luminous one. You know, shining and then put uh screen bling 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 and then put all the Christmas light and then carry a battery so that it starts to blink or so, you know, so that you are the light of the world or something like that. No, avoid that. Huh? Okay. Um, be humble, simple hairstyle. Pastor Grace used to like to tie into a bun, okay? And then once in a while, she let her hair down, you know. Yeah. But make sure that don't let your vanity take over. You just want to be tidy and your fingernails, <clears throat> okay? And uh, also watch your perspiration, men. Men, right? Uh, sometimes uh, you 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 find that uh, uh, some men say that they will not put uh, you know uh, the cologne to help them. You know, they say uh, I prefer God natural smell. Uh, but many people don't prefer your bo. Okay, so you have to be very careful because what you are you, you see a preacher is not just on stage. A preacher is somebody who is a minister. So you are going to mingle with people. 
And people are first going to see you on stage, but then after that, you're going to lay hands on people, you're going to pray for people, you're going to counsel people, and therefore your appearance got to be proper. Imagine if I come and pray for you and my, I, and my fingernails are so dirty, you know, and I haven't cut it for three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, you know, it's like Dracula like that. So I come and hey, hallelujah, hallelujah. Then you'll be like, oh dear, you know. <clears throat> So be very careful. Uh, head movement here. Uh, if you are involved in, uh, let's say you are involved in a class, you are a, now as a preacher, what is going to happen here? You don't only preach on Sunday because they are going to invite you. You are going to conduct seminars. You are going to teach in classes. And sometimes they will ask me to teach in the adult Sunday school. And then in that, they will be asking questions. And so, your head movement will be very important. Like, for example, when people talk to you and how you're nodding and then you're smiling in agreement and then slow head nodding, right? Means I'm very attentive. I'm listening to what you are, the question. And then, for example, when somebody uh, give a very good answer, you know, and then you can, you can go a bit, means that I agree, I agree. But then when you begin to, to have fast head nodding, they tell you, you, you have become very impatient. You know, quickly, 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 you know. And so be very careful. You know? Every time you want to know very fast, slow down, slow down. All right? Don't show your impatience. Okay? I know you are so impatient, but praise be to God. Slow down. All right? Now, uh, this is uh, Pastor D.D. Jack, and I, I, I know his, his style is like that because he's a very tall man, big man, you know. And then every time he come out, he'll look like he look up into the ceiling like oh. But everybody love him because they know that he is very naturally humble. But if I no, I can't look up the ceiling, you know. God naturally put me very humble. I, I actually there was a, there was a time I was preaching in one church, and then uh, after the sermon, this brother came to me and said, Pastor. I really appreciate your humility. I say, huh? You know, you always, you know, put your head down like that. I said, brother, there's no humility. <laughs> that is called suffering because I naturally hunch. <laughs> oh, he said, you naturally hunch. I thought that you always humble like that. I said, no. <laughs> if I could, I will raise my head high. And so, now, those of you, you, you can, but be very careful. Don't held up so high, okay? And then uh, that when, when some people talk to you and then you hear, then you look at from the corner of your eye, you know, you look down like that. And then you are very arrogant. You are very, very, very proud. But you put your head up is fine, you know? It means that you are neutral. You are listening. You are looking at the person. Especially when the person talks to you, make sure that you look at the person, all right? Uh, question and answer time. And then... Uh, head forward is that, uh, like when I was uh, uh, lecturing in Haggai, right? And then when I, when I approach a student and I ask him question, and then he answer, I normally lean forward. Means that I'm listening to you. So I did that on purpose so that to encourage him to talk, that I have interest in his topic, I have interest in what he was trying to say. Okay? So then, Head tilted down, uh, maybe like tilted down and look from the top of your eye here, you know, means that you are looking with disapproval. And so all this you try to avoid. All this you try to avoid. Even children, when you behave like that, and the children will feel that they have been reprimanded, yeah? Or head shaking like when the person... At one time, uh, Dr. Ravi uh, was uh, uh, trying to explain uh, some truth here. And then the questioner, while Dr. Ravi was explaining, the guy who asked the question was an atheist, and so he shook his head like that. And I literally saw Dr. Ravi, uh, Zechariah, got upset. And he said, don't you shake your head like that. <laughs> he, got, he lost his patience. Because everything he said, the guy, <laughs> right, disagreement, disagreement. And then later on, he apologized. I think you can catch uh, the, the video on YouTube. 
and then head down, head down, negative, disinterested. Like when you are talking to me, I'm a head down. All right? I'm not interested in what you say. So if you are a preacher, if you are a lecturer, if you are a teacher, all this movement, not for you. You cannot do like that because you will hurt the, you will hurt the students. Okay, facial expressions here. You know, you can frown, you can smile, you can grimace, you can grin, you can snarl, you can have straight face. <laughs> okay? Uh, you find that I prefer smile. And this smile here, this smile that I have, uh, is not plastic smile. Why? Because it has to connect with the eye. You must see the eye. The, the real smile is not just in the mouth, but in the eye. So if your eyes are smiling, then you find that people will know that you are genuine. Very importantly is that you need to be genuine, especially when you become the ambassador of the gospel. You are not your own. You don't say, I have my right. You have nothing. You have no rights. The right belong to the Lord. When the Lord say to you that you have to smile, you have to smile. Some of us here, you know, say, I'm sovereign. I'm sovereign. I, I do what I want to do. No. And uh, of course, uh, you, you'll find that some um, just keep a straight face. But why do you want to keep a straight face when you can smile? Okay. Now here, this is some of you. This is your good friend. Can you see? You you, you look at, at him, right? You see the eye and the mouth. Okay. This is called a tight lip smile. All right, tight lip, not opening up. And so it's a pasted smile. And maybe when he was in business and he was doing like that to show that he was pleasant. But now he is the president, uh, the president of the United States. But he continued to use this kind of a smile. And so sometimes it can be read as a rejection signal. It means I does not, uh, he, he doesn't want to share anything intimate, especially when he smiled like this with the reporters. Uh, he and the media, not very close. And so he put on this other smile. So in fact, you can go to the YouTube and watch him. And then later on when he put his smile, like when he was asked the question, uh, why did you uh, call this uh, China virus? Then he looked and said, because it came from China. Then he put that pasted smile, all right? So it's a suppressed displeasure, <laughs> like a false agreement. So. Being a pastor, you have to watch it. You, you can't afford because the gospel of Jesus Christ is more important than all these things. All right. Yeah. So you have to learn how to smile properly. Uh, here, uh, there are twisted smile. All right. I, I, I don't even know how to do, do that, but there are mixed emotion or sarcasm like twisted smile, one, one side. All right. Or drop jaw smile. Ah, like here. Uh, Clinton, right? You you can know that it's a practice uh, fake smile. <gasps> you are so good. <laughs> I can't do it. <clears throat> or the bottom lip jutting out, you know, upset like, mm. okay. Uh, some of you with uh, children, you you will know that the spouting kind of lips. Oh, I don't like mm, uh, like that. And some older people also behave like that uh, when, when you are displeasured. Huh? <clears throat> and then the biting lips. Now, of course, when you are preaching, you don't bite your, your lips. But when people start to ask you questions and you have tension, and then if your habit is biting lips, then watch it. All right? Because it tells you you're anxious, you are, you know, you're very concerned. Are created or to a point sometimes you even grind teeth but i haven't seen this thing that, that uh this one is in the book but i've not seen that people really grind teeth when they are uh in the suppression of fear yeah uh, maybe some of you can show me how this is being done uh pursing lips i've seen you know uh have you ever seen uh like my, my mouth is so big right and then when I get very upset, right? Then suddenly the mouth becomes so small. Pursing lips, very upset. Means I'm not going to talk to you. Okay. 
So sometimes I ask my wife, hey, how come your lips so small? <laughs> Holding the temper, right? Uh, chewing pen or pencil, self-comforting. In a meeting, uh, let, let's say uh, you have been invited to a, a meeting with the other pastors and then you get bored and then you start to chew your pen and pencil and the worst thing is that you start to bite your, bite your nail. Whatever that you do, you are, a, you are a preacher whether you're on stage or you're off stage. All right? Especially when you're called to be a pastor, we have the honor of calling you pastor. We will address you as pastor means that we honor the call of God in your life. Now, even though some of you have been appointed by me to be pastors, I address you as pastor. Why? Because it's not because I appoint you as pastor. It's the Lord. And then because the Lord has appointed you as pastor, I honor that call of God, all right, that divine call of God in your life. And therefore, I address you as pastor. But I've seen some pastors, they address their junior pastor with name. Hey, Jack, Joe, and all that. But for me, I would say pastor uh, so-and-so, all right? So this is, uh, this is called honor and respect. All right, haptics is body contact here. Nowadays, uh, since the COVID-19, we don't have so much about this. But uh, you will find that when you go to different places, I've been to America and I pastor a church there. Every Sunday, every Sunday, uh, all the members will come and hug me. I would be the smallest guy in the room, all right, in the hall. And they would be so big. Some of them are six feet plus, you know, and then 300 over pounds. And they will come and hug me because they love this touch and this friendly, this hug. And then uh, shaking hands, of course, you know, pat on the shoulder. Uh, the language of love is, is, is touch. Now, how do you do that? So you find that when, let's say, for example, I'm in India, and then I normally have to ask first the pastor whether uh, in, the, in this particular uh, Indian uh, area, all right, whether you allow me as a man to lay hands on the ladies. Always ask. Or you as a lady pastor, whether you are allowed to lay hands on the man, on the head. Now, if you never ask and you lay hands and the man just turn away then you know that you have done wrong okay so always ask always be humble and even to a point of being embarrassed ask say can i lay hands and so i can i can assure you in india some places i wasn't allowed to lay hands pastor grace could lay hands on the ladies but not me but in some places yes and in some places pastor grace not allowed to lay hands on the man. All right. So this one you have to you have to find out. And then also some places they don't they are not tactile. So they, they do not practice a lot of touch, especially in China. You don't be so friendly and then you hold the even the auntie, you know. But you must understand the auntie is my age. So when I hold the auntie hand and say, oh so good to see you and then massage the hand you know oh showing when i care for you then the auntie will say this pastor very hums up uh, this pastor you know something wrong with him and then when you preach uh, she can't hear it because this pastor was flirting with me flirting so you girls also same thing you know when you are young and then and then some some man in the church come and shake your hand and then you so liberal and shake your hand, oh. And then the man say, oh, she likes me. Oh, she's flirting with me. And so when you preach, you know, until all the heaven and earth uh, all came in already, all the angels all came down and sit on the front row. Uh, and this guy will can't hear you because why? Because you, your haptics, your body language, or, and your, your interaction, your tactile all wrong. Okay, so watch it, all this friendly punch thing, all that. In America, this thing happened, they'll do friendly punch, but, but you don't do a friendly punch to the pastor's wife in China. The pastor will punch you, okay? So <laughs> be very careful. Okay, prox proximix. What is proximix means that proximity? Personal bubble, uh, 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 personal space bubble. In Asia, some countries uh, are closed, some countries are, are very broad. So you find that in Middle Eastern, they are almost like kissing. 
Okay, why? Because if you are my friend, I must uh, allow you to bathe me with your breath. And then I will bathe you with my breath. And so my breath had mutton, you know, the mutton I've eaten like three weeks ago. Rotten mutton, they will affect you. And then your rotten mutton will affect me. Yeah. So that personal, that is the, the term of endearment. We are close. And so you find that sometimes when you go to Middle Eastern uh, uh, countries or you go to some places, you find that some of the pastors, they want to be so close to you. And then because we are Chinese, and so we try to, so every time the pastor approached me so close like that, and I will move backward, you know, because my, my space bubble is very big, but his is very, very small. And then in uh, Philippines, I discovered something is that when the pastor is very close to me, uh, he wants to hold my hand. It's a male pastor, not a female. A male pastor will hold my hand and drag me all around the church. And I felt so awkward because I felt like, am I a gay or what? You know, why are you holding my hand? But to the Filipino, this is called friends. You are my friend, so they hold your hand. All right. But maybe now younger pastor may not be doing it. But in the 1980s, uh, that was my first culture shock kind of thing. While wow, they're holding my hand. And so, Look out for the social norms, the situational factor, the, personal, the personality, the char characteristics, and the level of familiarity. Then you can go, like for example, you are very close to somebody, then maybe you can give a hug. Uh, uh, in Singapore, a hug is acceptable, but still um, uh, the person who wants to hug you, he will actually almost like watching you and asking for permission. Uh, but in America, they don't. They see you, ah, pastor, they just hug you. Male or female, they will just hug you. Okay, so this uh, would be the kind of chart that later on when I send you these slides, you can look at the distance, like for example, intimate. The first circle, all right, is intimate, whereby, of course, your spouse can be there. And then personal, and that can be your brother or your sisters or your cousin and all that. Then social, you find that is that far, uh, which means that these are acquaintances or just strangers, and then they stand that far. And now uh, further, you see outside the circle, that's COVID-19. All right, you see outside the circle. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, what time is it now? All right. Proficiency in, in, in uh, language. Wow, time is flying. Now, every preacher makes mistake in terms of using improper grammar and vocabulary. I make a lot of mistakes. And so, therefore, therefore, my wife will come and tell me and say, uh, you know, just now uh, you were using the long, uh, wrong, wrong uh, tenses, you know. You were actually talking about past tense, then you switch to present tense, then you switch to future tense, then you switch back to past tense. So you are men of all season, you know. They are all mixed up. Yeah. So, so I have to say, okay, okay, I'm going to use past tense. When I, whenever I talk about Jesus, I talk about past tense. Then when I talk about present days, then I use present tense. All right. So then I consciously make that kind of a change. But don't tell you, you yourself, say, oh, I can't change, you know, Pastor, I can't change. No, everybody can. If this old buffalo can change, you can change. Okay. So you have to learn your grammar, you have to build up your vocabulary, which means that, now, Dr. Ravi Zacharias said at one time in the seminar that I was in, you know, and it was so amazing, you know what he said? He said that my favorite pastime, my hobby, I said hobby, wow, must be playing chess, lah, huh? because this guy, brilliant guy, you know, must be playing chess. He said, my hobby is reading dictionary. Huh? Reading dictionary? Yeah. He said, I love words. And so he would spend hours just studying words. And no wonder he got so many big words that we don't even know. And in the, at that time, I was in my, my 30s. And when he came to preach, I assure you, more than two-thirds of his sermon, I did not understand. 
But I kept saying good, 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 because what I didn't understand must be good. Lah. So I said good, very good. But I listened to it myself 20, like one day, 27 times. I listened until I fully understood it. And so I started to create the habit of uh, learning new words. Yeah. So you will never drive anyone away with proper grammar. However, you may do so without proper grammar. So all of you who are, you claim to be English speaking, please speak English. All right. Huh? All right. No, no need to chum chum Chinese, chum chum Cantonese. Huh? Because when you go to other country and preach, you chum chum Chinese, chum chum in, uh, Cantonese, the Indian, they don't understand you. The Filipino, they don't understand you. The American, they don't understand you. The Australian, they don't understand you. All right. So you need to develop uh, this desire to be proficient in your language. Ah, vocabulary is good, but don't expand it to beyond what your people can understand. Now, if you can uh, preach with uh, uh, English language that uh, is understood by a primary four student, you are okay. So you don't have to use bombastic words. Now for Dr. Ravi, he got a different ministry because he reached out to people in all the top schools like Harvard, Princeton, Yale and all that. So they use very big words and therefore he got to use those big words and somehow be able to impress them, all right? Means speak at their level. So like you, when you are speaking to your uh, child and your child is only like one year old, suddenly you also behave like a child, isn't it? So you go susu, sisi, sasa, and then some of the language nobody can understand, but the, the, the child can understand and you can understand. Okay? So the, the same thing is that when you are now speaking to your audience, make sure that they can understand you. And then if, let's say, you are like preaching in Malaysia, for example, now <coughs> most of you are Malaysian. And so I can, I can preach in English, but I can throw in Cantonese. In Singapore, I, from time to time, I will throw in uh, Hokkien. Uh, that will be like the language of the heart. And so when I throw in some Hokkien word or some uh, the Cantonese words. So you find alternative words to explain what you want to say. So use the synonyms to explain certain words. If you find that people are being puzzled, so like, for example, I like to use this term, uh, uh, you know, that you find uh, John, he, is a, uh, he was a very gregarious apostle, you know, then people we, we like, Okay, what well, then you say, oh, John was a very friendly apostle. So you use a synonym. Then you realize that you use a very big word and then you cut that down. But then uh, you may use a local word. So here is uh, Pastor Peter Tanchi, a very famous pastor from Philippines, you know, and I love his sermon, a very powerful sermon. Learn a lot from this man. Uh, but from time to time, he was switched to the Galo. Wow, you speak to that. Because then people will laugh, but I didn't understand what he was saying. But he was talking to his people. So the language of the heart. So nothing wrong to use the language of the heart if you have to. <coughs> okay, now I'm going to talk about the conclusion of, uh, to your sermon. I know that the, the, the time is uh, almost up. We've got three minutes, but I, I need a bit more time. So I'm going to drag a bit further. Okay. Uh, so if you have something to do, then you can leave and then you can watch the video later. Now, the conclusion of the sermon may be presented in such a way that it would come as a surprise. Means that when I conclude, you don't even know. All right? Means it, it will, it will it form as a surprise to you, it form as a shock to you, but then you close the sermon. And sometimes that is good. Uh, but sometimes you want to say, finally, <laughs> right? Finally. Uh, when you say finally, make sure that it's only say once. 
uh, but not like me. Sometimes I say five times. Uh, I will say, I will use all the synonym, all right? I will use like, you know, I will, I will say, and lastly, and finally, in conclusion, <laughs> I still not ending yet. And then I will say, by the way, which means I'm going to add a new point. Means that in my conclusion, I cannot add a new point, but I will add a new point because I remember I forgot it. I forgot to share about it, you know, earlier on. So I say finally, but then I add, oh, by the way, I want to tell you this. So if you want a surprise, then don't announce it with words like lastly, finally, or in conclusion. Okay, that is if you want it. But if you want to say finally, it's fine. Or you say lastly. Okay, or you will want to say in conclusion, God's love. You know, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So avoid action. If you want a surprise, avoid action that may give away the surprise like <coughs> your Bible. So what we normally do in those days is that like, like our pastor, you know, when before my, the lady pastor who came and be my pastor, I, we, I had another pastor, uh, Pastor Ferguson, and, uh, you know, and he loved to preach long sermon like what your true, truly here love to. So I learned from my first pastor to preach very long sermon. And so he said, uh, no, no, I, I watch him. The very moment he closed the Bible, means end already. Means we can go eat laksa already. <laughs> so, so if you want to put it as a surprise, don't close your Bible or don't close your iPad, you know, don't, don't, don't put off, all right? Or don't put away your notes. Like some pastor, in conclusion, right, they will take the sermon note and stack it and put it in the Bible. Or some pastor, in conclusion, will take out the glasses because this is the reading glass and then they, they will take out, which means that, you know, they are not going to check their notes anymore. So make sure you don't do this if you want a surprise. Now, then in your conclusion, always go for the harder because now you have already give instruction, you have already give ideas. Now, what does your sermon want the audience to do? Because your conclusion is always uh, a demand for action. Okay? So what is your sermon requiring? What is your sermon demanding? Uh, uh, and then what is the take home value okay so your conclusion remember your conclusion will require action from the audience a response from the audience you want them to come out to be prayed for so that is a response that is a reaction you want them to take or you have a key point that when they go home they can start to change their life for example you want a take home value like Let's say you are speaking to people who have been very harsh with their wives, and then you want them to this hundred zero means that you say hundred uh, percent, you know, that you will uh, love your wife hundred uh, percent, all right? That you will treat your your wife well, and then zero percent you expect your wife to treat you well, and so that is a take home value. That is a demand. That is what the sermon requires. So at the end of the sermon, I will say, you need to do, do that. And then I might even ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And how many men will say, yes, Lord Jesus, please help me to be a hundred zero uh, husband. All right. And then hands would go up. So that is what you want. So go for the heart. Okay. And then... Uh, like I said, no additional new information at this juncture. I am the worst culprit of all because I always got so many things in my head. Excuse me. If I conclude and if I say, by the way, uh, I think you all better wave and say, no, by the way, Pastor, no, by the way. <laughs> because you know why? Uh, the proper way to conclude is five minutes. The best time is four minutes. In four minutes, you finish. You finish, auto call, they come up. Okay? So when you, your conclusion, make sure that you have enough text for you to last 
four minutes. I have one uh, preacher who came to High Praise Church at that time. Uh, and then it's so amazing. Uh, his conclusion was that, uh, that if you agree with what I say, if you agree with what I say, I'd like to shake your hand. Can you come forward? And people literally <laughs> would come forward and shake his hand. So I was like, wow, I have never seen that. But he, he did that. So his conclusion is like less than two minutes, but people were coming out to shake his hand. Okay. And then uh, drive home the take home value. Do not ramble. Make your conclusion short. Hit it straight to the point. So conclusion got to be brief, short, brief. So we, we, we have said that. All right. Let's see this kind of a... Now, how do you conclude? You can either conclude with a summary. For example, I've been talking to you about prayer. Philippians 4, you know, uh, verse 6 and 7. And so I'm recapping the main points. And so in your conclusion, right, we are not to worry about anything. The Bible tells us we are not to worry about anything, that when we pray about everything, uh, when we are worried, we can pray about everything, and then we will experience the peace of Christ. And then, you know, how many of you this morning, you are going to respond and say, yes, I'm not going to worry about anything because I have Christ. I, I have the fullest confidence that Christ is here to help me. If that's your prayer, please raise your hand. So you see, that is how when you, when you summarize it, you go for the heart. All right. Now, there are, maybe there are specific application and practical application. So that your sermon has been abstract or your sermon has been a parable or your sermon has been inductive, right? Means that now you come to a big conclusion here. And then what you want to do here is that you may need some time to give them specific takeaway and a concrete call to action, okay? So that to those of you who have been uh, worshiping idol, you are going to say no to this idol. You are going to go back and you are going to remove this idol because you are going to say, I have only one God. So what happened here is that you are preaching about the theology of God, you know? You are, you are saying that there's only one God and then you have no other gods before me. And so you are going to say things like that. And then you are going to say, uh, those of you who find that uh, maybe your, the movie is your idol or your golf is your idol and all that, then you have to go back and you have to deny yourself. So you have specific takeaway and concrete calls to action. All right. Sometimes is in the conclusion, uh, you have to answer objection because you have to pre-think what the audience would be thinking about. So you identify what objection your audience uh, could have about your sermon and what specific instruction that they do not like to follow, all right? And what do they find uh, difficult to believe? So you say that, for example, <clears throat> you say, there are some of you who say that, Pastor, I cannot read my Bible. And every time when I read my Bible, I would fall, fall asleep. And because you convince yourself like this, and that is because you convince yourself. The devil put this thought in you and you say amen to that. Instead of saying amen to God, you say amen to the devil. Therefore, what happened here? That automatically, every time when you open up your Bible, the devil whispers to you and say, you cannot read your Bible. You are going to fall asleep. And therefore, you respond to the wrong voice. But this day I say to you, there is another voice more powerful than the voice of the devil, the voice of God. And he's going to tell you, you can read your Bible. You, you see what happened here is that I anticipate his objection. And I give him an alternative. And this is how what preacher is doing is that step by step. You know, these four years in, in, in faith line here, what I've been doing is that consciously and purposefully, step by step, I've been preaching and helping to make sure that when you take home, they are practically change. change of behavior, change of your character too. That allow the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit to work in you because you are willing to be changed. So as a preacher, you must be able to do that. Now, those people who do not follow my sermon, they don't see that. 
but I can assure you many families and many ma marriages are much better because of the hundred zero. Right? The hundred zero principle means that hundred percent, right? I want to please my, my wife. You, you see, so some of these are very practical takeaway. Okay. Then the other way is that when you are preaching a deductive uh, sermon, means that you give the conclusion already, you, you give the end result already, then you go into the points, and then now you come to the end result, which means that you return to the beginning. All right, you go a full circle and you go back to introduction. So remember that when you are preaching deductively, you have to go back. And so maybe you have to reiterate and you have to repeat again, you know, the introduction. Okay. Um, and also in conclusion, what you do here is uh, you, can, you can cast a vision of the future. Means that in conclusion, I challenge the audience to pursue after something that will benefit them if they were to do this. Means that the result of what you are going to do will be this. And I promise you that your children will love God if you were to do this. You see, means I'm casting a vision. I'm casting a vision of your family. So a preacher, you have a lot of divine power with you that you can help family to turn around, all right? You can help wayward children to turn around. Uh, this uh, Pastor James Masai is one of the Church of God. He is called the Prince of Preachers in the Church of God, but he had, he had just passed away. Uh, so uh, three types of preachers, those you cannot listen to, and those you listen to, and those you can't help listening to, all right? So you, you choose. Now, if you want to be a preacher, I suggest you be the third one. Those you can't help listening to. Means that, means that when people listen to you once, they want to come back and listen to you again. And your church will grow because they want to come back and listen to you again. Some pastor asked me, Pastor, why are my church not growing? Because you are the people nobody wants to listen to. <laughs> Very sadly, but that's true. Okay? Okay. Uh, should I continue? I think I should. I just have a few more points very quickly and I will finish because next week, next week I have to tell you some, some other thing. I have to tell you how to write all your, how you write your sermon, okay? So I think I better finish this. All right. Okay. Uh, I know some of you are sleepy, but this is good for you. Mumbling preacher. All right. Such a person is not a preacher. Because he could not, uh, and he should not preach. Because he mumbled, he only talked to himself. And it can be cured if he used the, the mirror. So throw out your voice, throw out your, your voice. The other one is roaring preacher. These are shouting, 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 shouting. Shout from beginning to, to, to the end. Why? Because sometimes it's to cover the self-consciousness or nervousness. Or sometimes some pastor will shout his wife because they lose the direction of the sermon. So they just shout, all right? And they shout, God is good, amen, amen. Uh, God is good, amen. And they kept, keep shouting and then let people say, give me a big amen. But actually he's trying to find his way. So he shout three times, God is good. And then you are like, okay, wow, so powerful. But then he lost his way. Then he found his way, then he back. Yeah? Then the chanting preacher, Rhyth rhythmic flow, light waves, that comely rise and fall. Hallelujah. You know how God loves you, soothing and encouraging all of you to fall asleep. This, please don't preach like this, because I will also fall asleep. So you see, this is the rhythmic, this is the kind of like the monk chanting like that. Yeah. You ask me whether I have met such a preacher. Yes. And sadly, it was in Foursquare. And when somebody said, uh, Pastor Albert, can you invite this uh, pastor to preach in Faith Line? I say, not on my life. <laughs> no way. <laughs> All right. Ah, the monotone, the monotone, the monotone. The message has only one tone, one feeling. Flat, colorless, expressionless. 
Because if you have any tone, then you will take away from the glory of God. No tone. One tone. That's all you do. One tone. Now, if you are a natural monotone, you better learn how to switch a little bit, all right? Uh, you can come to our preaching camp and then we will slap you a little bit and you will change tone, yeah? <laughs> okay. Mm. The whispering preacher. Because God is love. God is love. You must understand. He loves you so much. So much, so much. That when you say like that, he can't even hear you. Have I seen such preacher? Yes. Dramatic. I can't hear. All of us need healing in our ear. So please don't be too dramatic, please. Yeah. Okay. Repetitive preacher. As I said before, and now I repeat. And so I repeat, and so now I say, and I say, and so I <laughs> did you know that, okay, don't say preacher. Let's say when you were dating, right, when you were dating, and then you have this uh, man or, or, or this girl, you know, and this girl will tell you the same story again and again. Huh? So I, I will never date her again. Of course, the same story. Repetitive girlfriend, you know, <laughs> story, same story. Ah, yeah, I cannot. All right, so please don't be that. Um, then, ah, uh, this one is me, like, throat clearing preacher. But this one is not really me. Because like an unnecessary clearing of the throat in the midst of a sentence and then at the end. Let me, let me try if I can imitate how you say that. Uh, um, and Abraham, when, when, he, when he took his son, <coughs> he took his son to the mountain mm, to sacrifice his son. <coughs> and uh, that is, so half the time you are like, oh, can we give him some water or something or give him some candy or something? You, know? you want to put your hand into his throat and take out all the, Nasty thing inside. Now, okay, one more thing. If you are helping a pastor, like let's say if I'm preaching, right? I'm preaching. Then I start to cough, right? Now, for young pastor, when they start to cough, means that you need to give them water to drink. But from old pastor that, that like, like, like my age, when we cough, you give us tissue. Why? Want to cough out phlegm. Old pastor cough out thing. Young pastor need to take in thing. All right, so please don't give me the wrong thing. You give me water, I will drink my phlegm in. Or you give me tissue, I will cough out. Okay, so this is some technique that you, you learn. All right, the meandering preacher, right? He'll preach one way and then go off on a tangent and talk about other things, right? Uh, I think some of you have this kind of, because they, they don't have slides or whatever. They don't have notes. So they'll meander, they'll go off, and then there are a series of disconnected remarks. And then preach for 20 minutes, huh? they chase the butterfly, chase, 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 then come back. Then they realize that they got still three points to finish. Then they rush. Uh, these are called the meandering feature. So please follow your, your notes. I'm going to watch your video when you, when you finish. Okay? Uh, this is what happened here. Uh, this is when Columbus started out on his journey. He didn't know where he was going. When he reached there, he didn't know where he was. When he returned home, he couldn't tell the people where he had been. So that he went all over that place, but he didn't know. Because he got confused, he thought America was India. All right? And then he called the Indian, he called the red Indian there. <laughs> so he was a bit confused. Okay, this is the last slide here. A good sermon has to be moving, soothing, and satisfying. All right? These are the three things. But please, don't move the audience out of the church after you preach. Okay? Moving doesn't mean move them out of the church. Soothing doesn't mean that put them to, to sleep. Soothing means that they accept the doctrine that you preach. Satisfying doesn't mean that you let them say, I have enough of this type of sermon. Then they quit. Don't. Satisfied means that they are being fulfilled. So I pray that all of you, uh, next week when you come, uh, we will talk about 
uh, how to get your sermon out. But in the meantime, I will be contacting you and then I'll be talking to you one on one. And if you can be kind enough to be in the Zoom room, then maybe one or two of you can be, and then we can uh, chit chat. All right. We will arrange for different time. Most probably, Sister Karen can help to arrange that. Huh? All right. Okay, thank you very much for your time. I know you are hungry or sleepy. God bless you.